Hi, I'm William Simpson, creator of New Vampire Book VMT, and you are now listening to the True North Country Comics podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book and graphic novel creators and supporters. I'm John Swinimer. If you want to drop me a line, you can contact me at john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. On this episode, I chat with William Simpson about VMT from Renegade Arts Entertainment. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. If you want to help the site and the podcast, please consider supporting the effort by chipping in at ko-fi.com slash truenorthcountrycomics. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. William, based in Northern Ireland, is an internationally renowned artist whose career began in comic strip art, working on a range of character icons including, but not limited to, Judge Dredd, Rogue Trooper, Batman, Transformers, Hellblazer, Tyranny Rex, Aliens, Vamps, and Indiana Jones. In recent years, he's developed his work in the film industry, providing storyboards for a variety of feature films, as well as for the extremely popular Game of Thrones. His work for Renegade Arts Entertainment includes the Shades of Grey series. His most recent work with Renegade is VMT, along with illustrator Laverne Kainzerski. The story of VMT goes like this. Someone is stringing up blood-drained corpses across the city in what appear to be ritual killings, leaving the cops scrambling for answers before more bodies pile up. Meanwhile, Sun, a young woman recently added to the ranks of the blood-sucking undead, feeds her hunger and rage on the men she feels deserve her wrath. Along with the police, more than one legendary vampire has their sights set on her too. A tale of blood, monsters, and those that walk amongst them seeking to help us all. And so, without further ado, here's my chat with William Simpson about VMT from Renegade Arts Entertainment. So, William Simpson, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. Thank you, John, for asking me. I appreciate your time. Uh, before we get started, I want to ask you, what was the first comic book that you read? Oh, my God. It depends. It depends what we're thinking of, because... When I was a kid, uh, I started off with things like uh, British comics, like Dandy and Beano, which mm -hmm. were the ones. But I soon graduated from those into reading war comics because we had, I don't know if you've seen them, the little small war comics, commando books and war picture library and so on. And the thing that got me was they were so authentic in their um, study of, you know, actual machinery, equipment and so on, that it was it was like many films, I guess, and and I loved them. I mean, they were they were very simple stories, you know, very very basic thing. That I guess that uh, British thing of the Second World War never ended, <laughs> and, uh, and so you you know they they were great. But then I was at a caravan site, wonderful wonderful thing, um, to see a aunt. I went out as a kid to the local shop that was on the site. I found my first two American comic books. And I mean, I remembered images from them for years without actually knowing, you know, where they'd gone to. But one was a Captain America, which um, was an issue drawn by Gene Colan. It was uh, the big ape character and Captain America falling down to the world of the Toad Man. It was stunning. And I mean, I didn't realize how much I loved Gene Colan's work until, you know, I understood who he was basically as, as, I, as I was reading more and more. Because the other comic that I got at exactly the same time was a Daredevil issue. It was the Cry Coward cover um, with the stilt man. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are comic books. They would come in and, 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 you know, off ships or something like that. And I mean, it was my first, you know, realization of, 
oh my god these are superheroes and this is incredible and then i would discover more um a lot of dc stuff because different supermarkets used to stock um dc comics and there was things like oh there was the the company that published thunder agents and stuff like that i was getting this mass of comic books as a kid you know it was all different stuff but those two are the first two major comics that I, a major, um, you know, superhero comics that I got. And I was, I just loved it. After that, I, I, you know, I was searching for them. And then, of course, in Britain, they started publishing reprint black and white versions of the Marvel comics. So we were getting weekly comics and it would be like you would have 12 months in 12 weeks. So you were seeing such an amazing amount of comic book artwork in such a short period of time. So you're also seeing the progression of artists very, very quickly. It's like the Jack Kirby stuff, you know, went from having um, like a mashed potato thing to where he became the, the really crisp, hard version, you know, that became the, the classic Jack Kirby um, Fantastic Four thing. I mean, this stuff was brilliant, but... We were seeing early Avengers along with Planet of the Apes in another comic book, along with Dracula Lives in another comic book. It was incredible because, as I said, it was just this massive pouring of great comic book artwork and writing. And anyway, that's what I got into. And, and, uh-huh. and then I discovered so many artists whose work I loved. Sure. No, definitely good stuff growing up. But I'm wondering who or what inspires you to create today? Oh, today? Yeah. Oh, that's well, again, the funny thing is, uh, <laughs> I have to say, because because after I'd finished my vamp stuff with Elaine Lee on um, for DC Vertigo, that had been done over. I mean, there was three series of vamps and um, I'd done Hellblazer previously to that. That was over quite a period of time, over a period of years, and it just slowed up a lot. During that time period, I got into doing movie work. And because I got into doing movie work, I was doing less comic work. And I ended up spending a lot longer away from even seeing comic work. You know, it it was like when you weren't doing it, you weren't looking at it the same. And so I would be seeing, you know, I would always keep a track of Frank Miller's stuff. You know, I loved it when Sin City came out and so on. I, I was a big fan of Dark Horse stuff. This is back in time a bit but i was a, i was a big fan of dark horse stuff you know I'd, I'd done some aliens for dark horse uh as well which was just a great experience working on something like that something that was a movie franchise over a period of time i seemed to miss out on a lot of stuff love and rockets i kept um picking up because i really love love and rockets i mean again amazing stuff and for me it would be more a case of certain artists i would have seen I was always watching Gene Colan stuff just because I loved this stuff. Joe Kubert stuff I loved. So anything that he was doing, whenever he went off into doing um, his kind of graphic novel stuff that was different from rock, you know, I was really interested in all that. I loved the Sergeant Rock from the back in the day, his army, our army at war. And then there was also people like Will Eisner, whose work I loved. But again, crazy thing about Eisner, he was still doing all that amazing work, obviously up until he died. And yet, You know, it was the same artist who had done the brilliant spirit work all those years ago. The funny thing is, during lockdown, when we all were hiding out from COVID, I would go back and reread stuff that I actually had. And I was buying up a lot of the essential books, you know, the Marvel Essential collections. So I did a whole run on reading Daredevil, um, which, of course, a lot of it was Gene Colan. I did a whole run on reading Dracula Lives, which again was Gene Colan. I was reading Kill Raven again, which I love the Don McGregor, um, Philip Craig Russell Kill Raven, which is just still one of those comic books that I keep going back to. I was reading Starstruck from Mike Kaluta and Elaine Lee. And then I got into a Conan kick where, where I found myself starting off with Barry Smith's Conan and then going all the way through reading um, lots of the John Buscema stuff. I mean, I, I know it's Roy Thomas writing, but the point is I remember it more as the artist than, mm-hmm. than anything else. And I mean, that, that Buscema stuff is still incredible. It was It's really funny revisiting it and realizing you know, in this world of manga now, it's it's like it's still brilliant to, to look at um, artists that had a more more of a classical training in art. And um, oh, my God, some of the stuff's incredible. I mean, nowadays, um, you know, I, I, I see work by Leela Leaps, which I love. 
um she, she's doing incredible artwork and um danny's stuff has been great her coffin bound was it that it was called which was great and then i mean people like mike mignola doing um you know anything connected with hellboy is still mm-hmm. a big thing that, that i would go out and, and pick up wow yeah because that was some of the last stuff i got was probably some of the the collections of hellboy and again i did a massive read on hellboy as well where i where i, I just picked up volumes and then sat down and got on with it and also of course i've been picking up over the years a lot of the you know the artist edition books and so the, of course i mean that, that's a major exercise to sit down and read those because of this you know you want the size of the pages because they're like you know the size you do your artwork at but my God, it, it's almost like you treat it, you know, you should have gloves on to just <laughs> turn the pages. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's beautiful, though. I mean, there's there's some amazing stuff. The last one I picked up was the Gene Colon Dracula Lives one in Forbidden Planet when I was hanging out there recently. So that is the last comic book that I got. It's an old comic book. So I, I'm sorry right. to say right. that a lot of the stuff is, is from the past. But... Yeah, because that's another thing. I ended up um, going back over loads of the Warren mags and, I, and I've and i been reading collections of Warren stuff um, because some of it was really good. A lot of the stuff in Erie was incredible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Vampirella stuff's Vampirella. I mean, it's it still was beautifully put, um, put together, beautifully drawn. And so there's a lot of that stuff that I was, I was reading. It's a big kind of widespread uh, market of stuff, you know. I loved... Oh, God, when Brian Hitch, now this is still years ago, because when, when he did the Avengers stories that he did, oh, my God, it really sort of pushed the edge, didn't it? I mean, it was, uh, I mean, they, they were so adult. They were right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, there you go. That's, well, that's a good stuff. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're here talking about your latest graphic novel, VMT, and that's from Canadian company Renegade Arts Entertainment. Before we go further, I should probably, uh, people haven't guessed by now, but you're not from Canada. You're from uh, Ireland. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, so there you go. So yeah. so there is a connection, though. You, you are, let's say, a world-renowned artist and creator and you've joined with renegade arts entertainment to produce a book called vmt so with that in mind i wonder if you could talk a wee bit about the story and what inspired you to create it this oh my god okay we kind of have to go back to vamps really on you know that, that i was doing for dc vertigo years and years and years ago elaine lee and myself came up with vamps about five biking girl vampires in london at one point or we honed it certainly in London. You know, it became something that I just loved doing. It was it was a creator owned piece, and it was it was something that Lane and I got a big kick out of. You know, working with her as well was fantastic. A whole different sensibility, and uh, and she's just amazing to work with. Kind of, we, we did three series of vamps, and in between that, I was doing bits of film work as well at that time. I also occasionally would be, you know, working with another company like, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite up to date on my own timeline, but I mean, Aliens was done, I think, in between um, some of the stuff like it might have been between Hellblazer and Vamps. I'm not sure. You know, I would always be just, you know, taking on mini series kind of things and um, and enjoying doing it. You know, really got into our vampire characters with Vamps, but whenever... DC didn't really encourage us to do anything else after series three. And we, you know, we were wanting to push on more stuff. It, it kind of got very, I don't know, somewhat irritating over the over that time period because, you know, Vamps had made royalties all the time. Every every issue that sold, we, do, we have no idea who our audience was, but the books went out there and we always got our royalty checks coming through, which was fantastic for Vertigo. So I, I kind of was concentrating more on film work because I wasn't sure what was going on with the comic book side of things. Elaine was doing games as well and st- doing more expansions on Starstruck. Over the years, we kept trying to see if we could get more stuff through DC, do more vamps and so on. It wasn't really happening. So at the same time, I was doing other bits of comic work um, in between the film work as well. And w- with Alex, I was doing a comic book version of a feature film that I'd worked on with him called 24 Hours in London. Uh, 20, the 24 Hours stories were, you know, they were just great fun to do, but we only did two of them. 
we kind of know that there's a need to do a third one <laughs> somewhere so that we can actually combine them all. The, th- the thing was, it, it had been a logical step from uh, the film version, which was it was kind of one of my very first feature films that I ever worked on um, when I when I got to do storyboards. It was for Alex. It was a low budget feature film that was possibly his first feature film as a director. It was just one of those things where uh, it was more about the fun of it for me. I was doing uh, storyboards and sending them over, them over by fax. And then two days later, Alex would be filming the sequence. And it, it was I mean, when, when I was asked about it, it was one of those things, you know, when somebody says to you, do you want to storyboard our low budget film? And you kind of go, well, what am I doing at the moment? Oh, no, I, I could do that. And then you're thinking, how hard can it be? It's a comic strip. <laughs> and the reality of it was, you know, I mean, it was like the kind of comic strips that I did because I'd grown up being so influenced by film so that doing comic work, it was almost like I'd been creating many films. Now, you know, no matter what I was doing, if I was doing Transformers or or if I was doing um, Judge Dredd or if I was doing, you know, Hellbiz or Batman or, or um aliens or any of that stuff for me it was always like you know in in a way a, a film sensibility was applied so in the end when i ended up doing film work it was almost like well it just made total sense but during that time period i'd shown alex some character things that i'd been working on which were the my, my vampires I, I think i'd done a couple of pages of comic strip storytelling I think I started with Sun, basically the Asian girl. It was kind of like I was just doing these things for my own amusement, something that I was really just enjoying. And Alex was encouraging about doing it. He was thinking, he said to me, we could publish this. And of course, then I I started to think seriously about it because I'd been explaining to him some of the the different uh, characterizations. And so I went back home. I think it was finishing off the or else I was we'd worked out the second book of 24 hours in London because it's been a long time. And the vampire story had started to gestate then. And I mean, I was over in Calgary doing this with, with Alex. We were sitting in a coffee shop up where he lives. Gosh, I can't remember the little town. And we were sitting in a, in a local coffee shop with brilliant lumberjack shirts all over the place, people <laughs> people coming in with a moose attached to their car. <laughs> and it was, oh, it was so brilliant. It was so beautiful there. There was, you know, snow-covered mountains dotted around us and sunlight belting through the streets and sitting in this kind of organic coffee shop working on 24 Hours in London. And I think it was the 24 Hours in Rio, that, that particular issue. So I'd come back and I was working on that and I was doing some film work and then, and I started to do more on my vampire stuff. And I was starting to find that they kind of were developing a life of their own, you know, so I would do a little bit more and uh, work up some of these characters. And then I, w- I started to do little mini stories, kind of shorts almost. All of that just made me sit down and start writing. The thing was, obviously, I'm known as an artist rather than a writer. But the point is, over the years, because when the film work started, um, it was mostly through the fact that my brother and I were working on some animation projects under um, our company Rogue Rocket at the time. We we had a bunch of our own animation characters that we, we got pretty close different times to them becoming something. But at the time, we were needing to write stuff. You know, it started off as discussions and things. And then I took on the chores of writing some of the characters. And because they were my own characters, you know, with Ken, it wasn't pressurized. And so the more I did of that, the the more fun I was having, the easier it got. I also had started writing live action film scripts because the other thing I was wanting to do was direct stuff. We got a music video to do, which was meant to be directed by somebody else and filmed by somebody else. You know, it's one of those things when when you're putting together funding to do something, you know, obviously you've got these different caches of of money. One of them dropped out. So we had two thirds of the money for this thing rather than the complete three. Basically, it was, well, we needed a director and we needed a camera person. They all turned to me and because I'd drawn the storyboards for the music video and said, well, you can do this. You've already (laughs) you've already visualized the thing. I said, fantastic, <laughs> okay, I'll I'll do it. I'll I'll go for it. And not knowing for sure 
how it was going to ha- work out but i went for it and I, we went on a location scout and i found all these places we had a couple of days to make it you know i i just knew what to shoot and it was the best thing i'd ever done because i was addicted and then i did a i did a short film script which i i put three film scripts into the film commission over here and they asked me which one do you want to do and it was basically i could have picked any of them and so I, I did this little movie called Cornered, which nobody's ever seen because I've got sound issues on it. And I, I, I still want to tease out the sound properly. Anyway, the thing is, it got me really into that side of things. I, I ended up doing a couple of commercials over here and then started writing more. And, and I'd written a couple more shorts. And then I started writing feature film length. Um, stories and basically the first one I wrote was a big science fiction um, story and I realized nobody's going to give me the money to do this this is like a hundred billion <laughs> film and um, I said I better write one that's cheaper so I wrote a thriller and I thought this is much better because it's much cheaper and then I thought I showed it to um, a producer friend and he said this would be about 26 million and I thought oh my gosh and I thought I better write another one that's cheaper and that was basically the way I went with these I started to do another story it was for a, a low budget feature film competition it was a road movie out of 500 entrants i was in the last five and i couldn't believe it it was like you know i just kind of come out of nowhere wrote this thing and and hope for the best and i was into the last five now the movie that won was a road movie it just happened to be not my road movie ah. So basically, there's a road movie was was made, which is a very good road movie called Behold the Lamb. And it's it's a cool movie. So there was that one and there was the four other movies. So I'm in there with the four other movies. But the point was, it made me feel, you know, just, hey, that's cool. It, it actually got all the way through to that. Yeah, I can write more stuff. So I have done. And um, the thing was, I got, I got into writing. I got into writing VMT just because. I started to have so many scenes and I started to put these things together and I started to see how the characters would react to things and what would take place with them all. And I started to know their identities better. I mean, since then, I mean, there's all I've got bookloads of notes of, of, of all sorts of stuff to do with them. As this one's come out, I'm actually working through the second volume of stories. You know, again, I, I designed them as, as six separate chapters to be like six separate comic books. But these days, it just seems to make more sense to bring out a book. I've still approached the, the new stuff as six separate chapters as well. You know, just uh, I think it's probably um, the best way to do things because who knows what will happen to it in the sure. future. But, but, the, but the thing is, anyway, I know I'm sorry, man, I'm rambling on here. But <laughs> That's good. But the thing is, everything's interconnected. You know, there's there's nothing, there's never been a time when I haven't been doing all sorts of other bits and pieces. I mean, there's a, a kind of a prehistory comic book series that I did for some friends that had a, um, a magazine that they were producing. They'd asked me, had I got anything? And I said, well, I have this. And uh, I drew up this little story called Horse Sense. And it allowed me to play around with kind of, um, sword and sorcery type stuff, which again is another area that I that that I love doing work on, which is one of the reasons why when I started doing Game of Thrones, it was almost like a godsend because <laughs> I never got to draw Conan, but there I was drawing loads of swords and armor and horses and all sorts of stuff as storyboards for um, you know, for this TV series. Right. So in a way, for the ten years I was doing that, it was like I was working on um, some of the things that I I really loved so much in a way you know storyboards are like layouts for comic book pages really they just happen to be you know a regular frame size and you're and you you know you are concentrating more on how a camera is moving around but you're still storytelling and you're still trying to find the dramatic moments to bring in characters and to do stuff with characters while you're you know you're you're dealing with the directors it's been one of those things that that stuff was going on while i was doing my other stuff And I just was enjoying myself. You know, for me, comic books had become a thing where I was kind of finding that love of doing them, which I'd never really lost. But because you suddenly were making time, you know, I'd come home at night after doing a day's work with TV stuff and I would sit down and I knew I'd have a couple of hours left. And so I would start working on particular illustrations or particular comic pages. And basically, that's the way a lot of the stuff that I was doing formulated itself. Um, So it's been 
quite an interesting experience because it's almost like going back in time you know when you first start off doing comic work and you're doing it for yourself because mm-hmm. you're you know somebody to notice it in a way and you'd have no professional experience of course at that time now i've got all this professional experience <laughs> and i'm actually doing the same thing that i did when i was a kid so it's bizarre that's good that's good maybe uh, just to get back to vmt if you could just yeah, maybe well, how would you <laughs> describe the story to someone Oh, my God. It's kind of three very diverse vampire types, and they are diverse. And in a way, there are three different time periods as well. One of the characters is so far back in time. I mean, she is almost like a thing of myth, really. Um, uh, and she's um, she's gone through time. And I've based her on Scheherazade from, you know, A Thousand and One Nights, except she's a vampire. <laughs> and it's a very different thing because... The making of her is a very different thing. And so what her connection with the world that we all exist in is slightly different because there is a different kind of awareness with this character. And then you have um, a character who has been around since at least the French Revolution, where, again, what happens to her I don't want to go into too much because the point is I want people to read the book rather than. Sure, sure, sure. But the point is what happens to her has has affected her approach to life and uh, her approach to the the people she has a tendency to go after because of the bloodlust. But so much of it is connected to what happened to her. And our other character, our Asian character, is somebody who, through a, a particular series of events, has become this thing. And she's the young version. She's she's the one that. Um, is kind of today's character as opposed to uh, Mercy, who is back in history a little bit, and Scheherazade, who is way back in time. So the thing is, you 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 have three very different characters with three very different reasonings as to what they're doing. Now, they're, they're, through the story, there's an interplay with um, a detective, an actual vampire hunter, and yet the vampire hunter is connected up with stuff that has happened in some of the other characters' past. So you're integrating you know, all these storylines. And of course, the whole first book is really just to, to give us a, you know, a, a bite of what these characters are, as opposed to telling everything, because uh, I had a lot of it worked out, but most of it has to go into the second story. I'm just going with it and building it up. You don't want to end up with The Matrix and then those other movies that came afterwards. Right, right, right. Nobody wants to look at it anymore. You want it to be like the first film stretched out better, you know, over three three stories. Anyway, I honestly don't know what else to... to yeah, no, that's give good. Care about yeah. it. it's, it's just that it's there's a lot of blood in it. <laughs> and also, well, the, the other thing as well, you know, obviously I come out of the, the vertigo stable of work where... I was very lucky. I got I got to work with Garth Ennis um, way, way back on Hellblazer. And, you know, uh, it was was such a brutal, messy story. But the thing is, that's the way horror should be. You know, a lot of the horror stuff that I've worked on has been kind of, you know, uh, nasty stuff. I mean, Elaine's vamps was, you know, we knew they were going to do nasty stuff as well. And we weren't afraid of that. But what was lovely about it was the kind of social side of what we were exploring, you know, the world that they were existing in and, and um, the different characters that they would be involved. With. I mean, I learned a lot from Elaine about certainly juggling multiple characters. And the thing is with um, VMT, I'm wanting to. It's kind of like exploring all the things that I hate. You know, th- th- this is what's w- what's good about doing your own book. You're looking at the world as it exists today and as it has existed and how you would like it to exist. And yet you're doing it within the context of a, a, a horror book. But you need it to be horrible. I mean, a horror book has got to be horrible. It can't just be something where, as I, as I, Alex and I did talk about this, but, you know, our vampires don't sparkle. <laughs> they, no, right, right, yeah. Like, like the T-shirt kind of says, you know, yeah. they rip your face off. And I mean, uh, the, the point is, that's important to me. No matter what the reasoning is for any of these characters, I want to explore our world the way it is. And, you know, we're in a crazy condition at the moment. I mean, I've only touched on the tiniest things. I mean, you know, it, t- it takes people, you know, 100 issues to turn out, you know, most of the exploration of, of the planet. I just like the way it continues and, and there's more stuff keeps popping up as more things happen in the world. You're just aware of 
how crazy it all is. We are in a crazy position. So I'm enjoying working on my own probably petty hates and uh, <laughs> uh, you know the, you know the, the, the attitude towards women's terrible the attitude towards the motivations of people is awful the religious structure is awful there's all so many things that you're finding yourself disagreeing with you know so I'm having fun in the comic book yeah. Speaking of, of the book itself, uh, you worked alongside illustrator Laverne Konjerski on this book. And I wonder if you could talk a wee bit about that collaboration process with him. Laverne, I mean, I, I met Laverne, I think, in Calgary. I think that was, I think that was it. But I, t- I talked to him via Skype or on the phone and stuff. And we only chatted really properly at the beginning of it all because I was constantly being pulled away doing storyboard work or, or conceptual work. The thing was, Laverne's brilliant. So what have I got to tell him? I have nothing to tell him. There's, there, there's, there's actually, you know, we had a really good discussion way, way back when. But the point was, I had total trust in Laverne to do his job. I had total faith in him. So, you know, the Archie Goodwin approach to, to working with somebody, which is, you know, if they ain't broke, don't fix them. I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, and um, and Laverne's brilliant. So um, it was uh, it was an easy thing to say. Thank God, there's a great color person on this because oh, I've had oh, I've had such extreme uh, <laughs> uh, coloring uh, on books that I've worked on over the years. So for me, Laverne is like a blessing, and I know I know now when I when I when I've got thoughts on the book, um, there's things that I probably will ask him about. If he agrees to do the the second um, uh, series, and it, it'll be just certain things that I now know better about from having um, uh, worked through the first one. But he's 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 great. You know, the 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 point is everything's clear, everything's everything's there. He's got atmosphere. He just knows his work so well. So yeah, that's the way I work with Laverne. Is basically. Go ahead, Laverne. <laughs> yeah, sure. Now, you've worked with Renegade Arts before on Shades of Grey series. I wanted to get your sort of feedback about what it's like working with Alexander Finbo, uh, the publisher there, and his team on VMT. What was it like for you? Well, again, with Alex, um, the thing the thing with VMT was basically I was just let loose. You know, I got on with it. And I presented him with stuff, and then, you know, he would talk about it afterwards. And then he had his team of people. But of course, the, the person that I knew that was doing this stuff was Laverne. So I didn't have to think about that. He got a great letterer on the job. There were some of the pages that I lettered up little bits of myself. I'm not the greatest letterer in the world, but I knew I wanted identity with some of the characters. So the sound, you know, it'd be in the letters. There, there was a sense of sound in the letters. And, you know, when you when you look at the brilliant American flag that Chaikin did and, and Ken Brusniak, did the lettering and i mean his lettering is so incredible because it punches sound you know you can hear the comic book and so the nice thing was i mean i've always valued the letters that i've ever had you know the guy called clem robbins all those years ago did he did vamps i think and he was he was fantastic as well flipping brilliant letter and all my life that you, you, you know this was the hand lettered artists and they're all artists that's the thing i mean you, you're you're looking at this amazing knitting of characters point is with again like i said about laverne it was the same thing you know alex knew what he was doing and it was like i trust him i mean i think he's i think he's made a nice you know really nice publication until you do the first one you're not quite sure of all of the ideas that you would have for something else but i had total trust in, in the guys you see the thing with alex was of course because I'd worked on the feature film 24 Hours in London, that was my first experience of Alex, and he was a really nice guy. We got on very well, and I, I did whatever it was that that, that, I, that I was meant to do, and he used it. And uh, it, when he moved to Canada, because, of course, he'd been doing this in London, when he moved to Canada, we kept in touch about stuff. And we'd always talked about doing 24 Hours in London as an extended kind of comic version. And he had a much longer tale to tell. And of course, again, making movies costs an awful lot of money. It doesn't cost the same kind of money to do a comic book. But the point is, you can explore so many of your ideas in the comic book. Alex, it was fantastic. It, was, it wasn't a problem. Then the first book, he sent me over the script and basically... 
you know, it was one of those things of, you know, do you want to do it? And I said, absolutely. And I made time to do the first book of 24 Hours in London. And then the second book, he'd moved the characters to Rio de Janeiro. You know, that was the one that we talked about out in Calgary because he got me out to do one of the Calgary conventions. It was one of Leonard Nimoy's last conventions. So it's quite a time ago. Yeah. Oh, my God. I loved Canada. Canada was just I was ready to move. I was so ready to move. It was one of the things that I told him when I got home. I told Wendy, I said, when we're going out to Canada because it's (laughs) it. There you go. The difference, oh my God, the difference of flying into America and flying into Calgary. My God, it was like, you know, one place was trying to shoot you and the other place was trying to lasso you and keep you. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's, that's the way it goes. There you go. So Uh, we've been talking about uh, VMT and you you mentioned how it's the first of many. I presume that your next upcoming projects will be focused on exploring the story. Uh, Do you have any other projects on the go? That oh, you're keeping busy with? I, oh I, at the moment, the page is on my drawing board at the moment. I'm working on a, um, a graphic novel that aimed at a French publisher. I've got about 12 pages of fully painted artwork that I'm trying to finish and then a lot of touch ups on the other pages that I've already done. So it's going to take a little while, but I'm enjoying getting on with that. And I've also got pages for a potential DC book, which I can't really talk about, but with with a bit of luck. Uh, I mean, it's it's something that came up um, when we were at a convention, Brian Azzarello and, and myself. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's going to, you know, pitch up because um, that would be great fun because we get yeah. on very well as well. Yeah. And I, I look forward to I'm so looking forward to that one. Plus, I've got pages of the third issue, the third chapter, third issue of the second series of VMT that I've got lying about on my drawing board here as well, because I kind of fluctuate between the things. Plus, I've got a short film that I'm meant to be filming soon as, a, you know, as a director. And it's a kind of a proof of concept film, which I'd already plotted out the um, uh, the feature film version. So the idea is do the short film, uh, show what one of the main characters is like, and then move on into pushing the feature film version. It's kind of in the horror vein, kind of a horror thriller, I hope. I'm looking forward to seeing if that will take off because it's it's something that, that would be great to play with. And it's, again, it's my, I kind of have certain themes that I seem to have been exploring in all of this work that I've done. It's all about, uh, I suppose, the strengthening of character that, that, you know, character starts off at the beginning, less sure of what they are. And by the end of it, there's a, a kind of a, a, a strengthening of their ideas or thought processes or their you know their place in the in the world that they're in so my science fiction ones like that my, my thrillers like that my horror thrillers like that i've got a bunch of stuff that i guess i guess we have a way of retelling similar stories but in very different forms and in different genres i also have one other one i've got a um i'd, I'd written a, a film set in thessaloniki in in greece I do the convention in Thessaloniki and I love it. I mean, I've, I've been out there like seven, seven years. It's so stunning to look at just because of the way the buildings are and the nature of ancient architecture tied in with modern architecture, tied in with kind of big modern hotels and and sort of really down and dirty little um, little cafes and stuff. And the point is... It's just got a great style all of its own. And I'd started writing a movie on the basis of being out there and some of the types of people that I'd met. I've ended up getting a thriller out of being there. At the moment, I'm starting this whole motion of trying to get that side of the planet interested in doing it. So, you know, I don't know how your life works, John, but there's this thing about you know, you're never on one thing all the time. You're, right, you're right. constantly yeah. juggling all sorts of stuff. And so I am. I'm constantly juggling stuff. I mean, Jesus, I don't want a boring life. So I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pouring out this stuff. I got a phone call the other day about another um, film job, which could take me halfway across the planet if it works out. So I'm kind of I'm just seeing what comes next along with doing the stuff that I am working on that I'm trying to make happen. So there you go. There, there's a lot of projects that I'm playing with. For sure. So with all that you have on the go, where do you recommend people go online to find out about your current and your future projects? 
the only place to really find me at the moment is on the social media side of things. I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter. I have no idea who pays attention to any of the stuff that I post up. And I don't know how far reaching it is, you know, because of the different rules that seem to end up going into play with, with any of the platforms is always bizarre. My website had gone down with Rogue Rocket closing up. So I've been constantly meaning to get a another website built because I have so much artwork that people can see. Now, the thing is, I've got so many projects that I'm wanting to do. Now, on Facebook, is probably bigger albums on Facebook that people could probably see. You know, their their, their art albums or their photographic albums or their, um, you know, film albums. On Instagram, I'm regenerating the art album because I was hacked this year. And basically everything and everybody that I was connected with were getting these insane messages going out about me having a clothes designing um, oh, company, my. which, you know, it was kind of ludicrous to me. And I was right. thinking, hey, that's that's a whole different side of me that I didn't even realize existed. <laughs> but the point is, it decimated my oh. Instagram. So my new Instagram is still running and I'm rebuilding by basically, you know, any time that um, artwork comes up or something comes up, I get to put it up on there. So people can find me, but it's it's a case of them searching slightly. I mean, people can find you so easy these days, can't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, William, those are all the questions I have for you. But I'm wondering, is there something I didn't ask that you'd like to get across in this interview? I did, you know, spend a lot of time on on possibly one of the one of the biggest series on the planet for once upon a time <laughs> with, with with Game of Thrones. I did a lot of work on Game of Thrones, but that's a whole other flipping interview, really. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it really is. No, I mean, I mean, there's there's a, there's a whole big film side to things. You know, there's a lot of different and interesting movies that I worked on. I did three films with Neil Jordan, the um, uh, Irish uh, director. And they were great fun. I mean, Breakfast on Pluto, Ondine, which was beautiful. And then Byzantium, the vampire movie, funny enough. And, um, you know, and I, I did a, a, I mean, my first big movie that I ever worked on was a thing called Reign of Fire, which was the big dragon movie with right. um, yeah. Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey. And mm-hmm. still looks good. Um, so that was great fun. I actually, oh my God, I just remembered I did a Disney movie a couple about three years ago. It was when COVID hit and it was, um, oh, what was it called? Oh my God, this is terrible. Look at that, my mind is frozen. It was um, part two. It was a sequel of, oh, yeah, the, the story about, um, oh, Disenchanted, it was called. It was this, it was from the movie Enchanted. So I, I, I worked on the second yeah, the the sequel. That's so, hitting Disney okay. Plus right now. Yes. Is it? Are you serious? Yes, with Amy Adams. Yes. Yeah, because I normally watch The Walking Dead and stuff. Right, right. <laughs> I'm still into my other stuff. No, but it's it's kind of nice. I mean, there, there there there's been some very strange movies, and I, I worked on a, a crazy romp years ago, which was um, Your Highness with um, Natalie Portman and James Franco, yeah. Danny McBride. And that was a most hilarious experience. I mean, I hadn't a clue what we were doing, but I was drawing pictures every day and I, I loved it. Those guys were great to work with. So I did that and that was just prior to Game of Thrones. And then I, I did the live action version of Halo. I did, um, it was this, another science fiction thing called Morgan. There's a whole bunch of stuff that, I, that, that I, I've worked on over the years. So um, as I say, that's a whole other big discussion. Thanks to William for the chat. You can discover more about William on Instagram at William Wiz, W-H-I-Z. You can discover more about VMT on Renegade Arts Entertainment site. And thanks to you for listening to the True North Country Comics podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to and like this podcast on Apple Podcasts. And please leave a good rating. Also check out the truenorthcountrycomics.com website and follow along on Tumblr at True North Country Comics. True North Country Comics is now on YouTube. Please like and subscribe to that video channel and hit the notification button. Please send your feedback to John at truenorthcountrycomics.com. And if you want to help the site and the podcast, please consider supporting the effort by chipping in at ko-fi.com slash truenorthcountrycomics. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. Thanks again for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. Truth Country Comics podcast is copyright Truth Country Comics, copyright 2022.